All right, guys, we're going to look at uh, section 8.5 about circumference and area in Euclidean geometry. And we're going to play around with GeoGebra to kind of investigate this a little bit. So I'm going to go through uh, basically what's in the textbook because I think it's a pretty famous theorem and pretty important. Uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at it and see what we get. So I'm going to draw here a circle. Uh, I should put it more in the center since so move that there. Okay. And we're going to play around with this circle a little bit. We know from a couple of days ago that we can inscribe inside of this circle a, uh, poly, a regular polygon of however many sides we want. Uh, I'm going to start, I'm going to draw a hexagon inside here. So to make a, a regular hexagon, I need to identify a few things. So I've got a point here. Now I'm going to identify an angle with a given size. Uh, now if it's... Uh, six-sided object, I'm going to have to take the angle 360 degrees and cut it into six. So I do want a 60 degree angle here. We'll make it counterclockwise. So it pops up and produces another point over here that gives me the angle. Uh, I'm going to make this, I'm going to adjust this just a tad so that it's going to be nice and horizontal. About maybe there. Uh, maybe a little bit more. There maybe. And uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to produce a regular polygon that uses these two edges here and makes six sides. So if I do that, boom, I have an inscribed triangle. So now I'm going to maybe adjust this a little bit more, make sure that it's nice and <coughs> rectangular. Now this is pretty interesting. The, the area of this hexagon is close to the area of the circle and the circumference of the hexagon is close to the area uh, close to the circumference uh, sorry the perimeter of the polygon is close to the circumference of the circle uh, so we've got a few interesting things here well we can actually make a little bit better of an, a better approximation by messing around a little bit with the midpoint in fact what we'll do is we'll actually produce a dodecagon by making a uh, 30 degree angle up there and then making a regular polygon from there to there uh, that's 12 sided now watch what happens see I get an even better approximation and I can do this again I can make a 24 sided one so uh, while we're here let's go ahead and give that a shot so I go from here to here and this time it'll be 15 degrees okay so there's the object there and then I'm gonna make a regular polygon with 24 sides that connect those two things those two points and sure enough I get an even closer thing and at this point I have pretty much almost filled the circle but technically I'd have to go forever in order to do this so it does look like it's going to uh, limit to that although to prove it uh, I actually need to show so first if you notice it's not too bad to show that the uh, sequence of areas and circumferences or sorry perimeters are increasing as I go up in fact if I uh, hit control Z here no, I can't do that um, let's see if I zoom in a little bit here you can actually see a little bit closer here let's uh, Okay, so if we look here a little bit, maybe zoom in a bit more. When I have this piece here, this line here, and I add in the new point in order to increase things, you can see I'm adding an area that I didn't have before. So all the area that I had earlier, I, I, I still have, plus an extra triangle. Uh, and also from the triangle inequality, you know that the length of this side plus that side's got to be longer than the length of this side here. And so the the perimeter of the thing gets longer too. So what I end up getting is I end up getting a uh, <clears throat> basically a increasing sequence of areas and increasing sequence of perimeters. Uh, you can also show that uh, this has a nice polygonal uh, uh, upper bound which instead of drawing the picture here I'll just refer you to figure 8.37 in the textbook in chapter on page 218. Uh, where they draw a square around this and show that the area of that square must be larger than, or sorry, the perimeter of that square must be larger 
than the perimeter of any one of these inscribed polygons. But I think you can kind of visualize that a little bit here, even if the precise proof is in the book. Um, but basically what happens here is we have closer and closer uh, values to the area or circumference of the circle. The reason why we want to have an increasing sequence with an upper bound is that if you have a sequence, a sequence of numbers that you're counting and they all and they have a bounce, they can't get any higher than a certain mark, but they're all increasing. If you remember a calc 2 result is that that sequence must converge to something. And so we can define the limit of that sequence to be something. And that's how you define the circumference of the circle. The circumference of the circle is the limit of the sequence of the perimeters of these inscribed polygons that we just drew down, just drew. The area is defined similarly. It is the limit of the areas of the inscribed polygons that we just wrote down. But there's something even more interesting about this. I'm going to push that out of the way. We're going to draw a new circle here. Okay. <clears throat> and pop down and put another regular polygon in here. So we're going to make another hexagon. Come here. Oh, I get, that's right. I need a point first. I'm going to select the point on the edge. Then we're going to go down here. We're going to an angle with a given size. So we'll come here. We're going to do a hexagon again because it's easier to see with hexagons. Uh, so we'll put a 60 degree angle in there. I'll uh, just, uh, uh, actually, let's go ahead and do the regular polygon first. So it's going to go from here to there and have six sides. Okay, so again, we can see it inscribed there. And I'm going to rotate this a little bit so it looks horizontal. Now, watch what happens if I take another circle with the same center, but a little bit smaller. Okay? Let's take a look at that for a minute. Oops. Okay. So we've got that right now. Now we'll make a uh, another uh, angle with a given size. Oh, I need a point first. Uh, so maybe we'll give ourselves a line from here to there for a minute. And that way I can identify a point. That's the place I want. Okay, now I will select this object and delete it. Oh, whoops. I don't want to delete it. I want to... Boy, I'm kind of mumbling here. Uh, so you can play around a bit with GeoGebra. There's lots of things you can do with this. Uh, so I'll click on this. I, I want to not show it. So I want to go to Settings, and I'll click on Show Objects. So the, the point's still there, but the line's not. So now I can draw an angle with a given size. Or, uh, so I'll go down here and I'll produce that. I want a 60 degree angle and that gives me the other point there. And then I'll create another regular polygon. Now what's interesting about this polygon here is you can see that it fits nicely inside the other hexagon. In fact, if I draw some rays here, uh, well, we'll use, uh, I guess we'll just use um, some uh, line segments. If I draw a line segment from here out to the edge there, you can see it goes through A2. I'll do that over here too. What do you notice about this triangle here and the big triangle up here? You should notice that they are both similar triangles, which means that the ratio of this side to this piece here is the same as the ratio of this side to this piece here. Now, this tiny piece from B2 to P1 here is the radius of the smaller circle. The distance from S1 to P1 here is the radius of that circle there. So what we just basically have seen is that this piece of the perimeter divided by the radius is equal to this piece of the smaller perimeter divided by the smaller radius. So if I added up all the perimeter, every, every piece there, and divided by the radius, I'd still have the same ratio. So, uh, uh, sorry, it's not the same ratio. I'd have the same ratio between the two hexagons. So if I add up all six sides and divide by the radius, the larger radius, I'll get the same number as adding up all six of the smaller sides and dividing by that smaller radius. Okay, 
Well, this is true no matter how many pieces I make because I just use similar triangles. So when I create the dodecagon, I get the same picture again. And so that tells me that the ratio between the perimeter at each stage of creating this uh, limit, limiting sequence, the ratio of the perimeter to the radius is the same no matter what, tri no matter what circle I pick. It, do, it only depends on the radius. It doesn't even depend on the location because I can still do the similar, argu uh, similar triangles argument no matter where the triangles are located. So since every property all the way up, uh, since every perimeter all the way up has this property, let's actually maybe uh, 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 write it down. Oh, I, didn't, I hit the wrong button. I want to click on this here. Um, <clears throat> basically, we're getting something like... Uh, P divided, the perimeter of one triangle divided by the radius of one triangle is going to be equal to the perimeter of the other triangle divided by the radius of the other triangle. And that perimeter argument is going to be the same no matter what I do, no matter how many different uh, uh, doublings I do on the number of sides. And in fact, since it's true for every stage of the way, then when I actually compute the limit, the same property is true. So again, I end up getting from that when I take the limit that the circumference of the first circle divided by its radius must be equal to the circumference of the second circle divided by its radius. Because of that, I know that no matter what circle I pick, this ratio is going to be the same. It's going to be the same number no matter where I am. So I'm going to give that number a name, and it's called pi. Okay, so we go back to GeoGebra. We just actually proved not that the number pi is 3.14159 and so on. What we proved is that the circumference divided by the radius of a circle, no matter what circle you use, is exactly the same number. And then we gave it a name. If you look at that then, uh, the radius is half the diameter. Okay, so if we go back to our paint here, this is telling us that if we say that this common ratio here that we just found, which is C over R equals pi, well, this tells us that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, C over R is tau, not pi. C over D is, is tau. So we'll call it uh, is, uh, is something else. So we'll actually, since C over the ratio is the, over the radius is the same, Oh, I totally misspoke here. The circumference divided by the radius uh, is tau, actually. It's, it's, uh, it's double pi. So if we instead put the diameter in here, this will equal the circumference divided by the diameter. And that was the number that was, that was assigned to pi. So let's fix what we had up here. Erase that. Boy, I'm going to select it and delete it and then make... Uh, Dr. Bob Pillay very happy by putting tau in there. Okay, uh, Down here we get pi, and that's what uh, the Greeks kind of used. And I think part of the reason might have been was because the diameter was actually easier to compute. And so it was easier to get your hands on the number pi when things were starting out. But we can see that even in this case here, the radius seemed to be the more fundamental object when we were talking about circles. Uh, but anyway, so this ends up being the number pi, and you can see now that the Area, the circumference formula, if I solve for this, uh, produces, uh, if I just multiply by the 2r, c equals 2 pi times r. And, and basically what you're seeing here is this thing right here that we just drew, that we just wrote down, 2 times pi times r, that's a definition of uh, the circumference of the circle, basically. That's a consequence of that. So we're defining pi to make that equation true. So in, in some sense, we didn't actually discover this equation. What we did instead is we actually discovered that the ratio of a circumference to its diameter was always the same number no matter what, and called that number pi. And then that tells us how to use that number to find the area formulas. Of course, if you don't know what that constant is, it doesn't really help you. So that's why there's been a lot of work uh, since this was first discovered into trying to identify exactly the value of pi. Of course. At this point, most of that's not worth too much because uh, we already know it sufficiently uh, well, even if we don't have every single digit because it goes on forever. But anyway, if you notice here, you can see that the same thing's true about the areas too. So if we go back to this triangle argument here where we got the inner hexagon 
and the outer hexagon, uh, sorry, outer triangle inside the hexagon. Uh, the air, the, these guys have similar triangles, uh, but because all their angles end up being the same, basically the areas uh, are also proportional to each other. And, and so what you end up getting is that the area of this triangle here divided by the radius is the same as the area of this triangle here divided by the radius. Really, it's divided by the radius squared. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can prove uh, sort of by a similar argument, you get the right uh, area formula. But there's an even cooler proof that puts together uh, the, uh, this, and so I, I want you guys to take a look at theorem 8.5.11. This is Archimedes' theorem. He proves that the area of a circle is one-half the radius times the circumference, uh, and the way he does it, uh, although I think the picture isn't quite as, as nice in here, is basically you can unroll a triangle out of the circle, uh, and the edge on one side, the base will be the circumference and the height will be the radius. Uh, but there's some other diagrams that show a similar, a similar thing like figure 8.4.1. So if you have your book, you can kind of see those things there. There's a nice little proof of Archimedes' theorem at the end. But basically that's the cool idea, for, the cool premise from this uh, uh, section is that we have all these circles uh, floating around. We can actually find pi and show that it must be the same no matter what circle you're in. Uh, and so this is pretty cool. Now one thing I will, I will mention that everything we did here depended on, on the fact that we had the similar triangle theorem. So all these results are only true in Euclidean geometry. In fact, in hyperbolic geometry, since similar triangles are exactly the same triangle, you wouldn't end up getting, uh, you wouldn't be able to get these cool uh, images here where you have uh, the same angles here. If you tried to draw this inside of a hyperbolic circle, uh, you'd end up getting different angles on the edges of the triangle here because they're not going to be the same triangle. Anyway, so that's pretty interesting stuff, uh, and hopefully that's enough to get you through the weekend. Uh, there's a couple of homework problems from this section, too, that are basically about this, but it's investigating these ideas a little bit further. It's actually pretty fun to mess around with the area of the circle this way and sort of see the method of exhaustion, which was about as close as the Greeks ever got to finding a limit. Uh, but that's, uh, and you can see that because that's how we phrased it. So it's pretty interesting stuff, and hopefully you have a, a good time uh, uh, reading it and trying some problems out. But other than that, have a good weekend, and uh, we'll see you guys on Monday.